Welcome to this morning's service. <laughs> it's lovely to be here, and if you're, if you're a visitor, a special welcome, and I'm a visitor as well, and it's, I bring greetings from Lossy Mouth Baptist Church um, to you here, um, and um, I'm one of the elders there and speak occasionally in church, so Graham had asked me to come along um, and speak this morning, so thank you very much for that kind invitation, Graham, and we, we pray the blessing, blessing upon him as well. Um, I'm always glad to be in Bucky. Um, I don't know if I've told you before, but I have a brother-in-law from um, Yorkshire, and I made a huge mistake a few years ago. I got him into running, and, and I, I quite like a half marathon because it's, it's 13 miles, and that's fine, isn't it? Because then you can sort of sit down, get a cup of tea, and go home, but he liked the marathon, so we did that, and then, of course, once he did marathons, he then went to ultramarathons. So we did the Speyside ultramarathon, and have I mentioned this to you before and said before? I don't think I have. Right. So we, 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 we did the Space at Ultra Marathon. So it starts at Bucky High School. So we both came along in the morning for the bus at half seven. So we get on the bus and off we goes. And um, we go up the valley all the way to Crag and Moor, which is Ballandalach. And as we're getting towards Crag and Moor, my, my brother-in-law, who's a Yorkshireman, says, he says, um, he says it's, a, it's a long ride in a bus, this, isn't it? And I said, yeah, it's going to be a long run as well back to Bucky. <laughs> and um, so we, we took off. And by the time you get to Fockabers, um, you've done a marathon. And then you have to then go to Spey Bay. And then you have to go to Port Gordon. And as I came through Port Gordon, we've done it twice now. One of the times I said to somebody coming through Port Gordon, one of the marshals, is it far to Bucky? This was the first time I did it, I think. And, they, and the person said, oh, it's just about half a mile. Now, when you've, when you've run about 34 miles, half a mile's quite a long way to go. And it wasn't a half a mile, was it? No. And the next surprise was, of course, was I got down to the harbor, and then the finish is just here. There's a wee park behind here. So, of course, they make the last 200 meters of this 38-mile run up the hill. So I said to this guy at the finish line, as I was coming up towards the finish line, I says, why did you make the finish um, up a hill? He said, well, we wanted to give you a challenge. And I said, well, I've just run from Ballandalach. I feel as though I've had enough challenges today. Thanks very much. So it's always lovely to be in Bucky. And when I come here, I always um, look towards Port Gordon, these places, because it's, it's a lovely walk and run along there. Yeah. 
Christ has led come before God with, with prayer. God, our Father, we thank you that you love us, and we thank you that you love it when we come to you to sing your praises, to pray to you, to fellowship together, and also to, to listen to your word. And we thank you this morning for Jesus. We thank you that he came and lived and died and rose again so that we could have newness of life, so that we could know the forgiveness of sins. And as we come to you this morning, Lord, we, we remember what Jeremiah the prophet wrote when he said, uh, from you, I have loved you with an everlasting love. We thank you that you do love us with an everlasting love. In all the joys and sorrows that we, f we go through, Lord, you, you always love us. You never let us down. You're the same yesterday and today and forever. And Lord, as we come to you now, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit afresh into our hearts, that your Spirit would, would well up within us like that river of life that comes from the throne of God, that that water would flow in our hearts, that you would touch us and fill us afresh. You would cleanse us, Lord. We're sorry that we're not what we should be. We ask that you would forgive us our sins afresh this morning. You would cleanse us by that precious blood. We thank you for the blood of Christ which was shed for us at Calvary. And as we come to you this morning, we pray for a fresh cleansing by the power of that blood. And we ask for a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit, Lord. You would fill us to overflowing. You would fill us, as Paul writes, with all the fullness of God. And may this morning's service be to your glory and to your praise. Amen. A man has a problem that seems impossible to fix. He can't walk, not even one step. He is paralysed, his legs don't work. His friends bring him to Jesus. He arrives at Jesus' feet, brought by his friends. I know what his friends have come for. They have heard about Jesus. They know what he can do with just a word. Listen, he's about to speak. Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. What? His sins? What about his legs? But some have a different reason to be confused. Who does he think he is? Only God can forgive sin. Is he saying he is God? Jesus knew what they thought. Jesus knows what we think. He knows our hearts. So Jesus knows our biggest problem, sin. Jesus knew that man's biggest problem, sin. It's even worse than his legs not working. Which is easier to say, 
your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. That got them thinking. It's easy to say, your sins are forgiven, because no one else can see a heart wash clean. But once he says, get up and walk, he has to do it, so everyone can see. But so that you know that I can forgive sins, get up, take your mat and go home. So the man gets up, hops, jumps, runs and dances home because if his legs are fixed, then so is his heart. And the crowd were watching, now amazed. Could they believe what they had seen him do? That God had given such power to a man who just looked like one of them? God has given Jesus the power to forgive your sin because that is what you need. Thank you, Jesus, that you can forgive us. This morning is from Jeremiah uh, chapter 31, and um, I'll just uh, read that now, and it's reading from verse 1, and it's, uh, it's probably about halfway through the book of Jeremiah, it's, not, no, it's a wee bit further than that, it's about halfway through, just over halfway through. Um, so it, it says this, Jeremiah 31. And verse 1. At the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, or the clans of Israel, which ties in with our Tartan theme, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when I gave him rest, when I went to give him rest, the Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, 
Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you and you shall be rebuilt, O Virgin of Israel. You shall again be adorned with your tambourines and shall go forth in the dances of those who rejoice. You shall yet plant vines on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and eat them as ordinary food. For there shall be a day when the watchmen will cry on Mount Ephraim, Arise and let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. For thus says the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and the one who labors with child together. A great throng shall return there. They shall come with weeping and with supplications I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar off and say, he who scattered Israel will gather them and keep them as a, father does his, sorry, as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. Therefore, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat and new wine and oil, for the young of the flock and the herd. Their souls shall be like a well-watered garden, and they shall sorrow no more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old together, for I will turn their mourning to joy, will comfort them, and make them rejoice rather than sorrow, I will satiate the soul of the priests with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with goodness, says the Lord. Amen. Let's talk to God in prayer. Father, as we come to your word this morning, we ask that you would help us to understand what you want to say to each one of us individually, and as a fellowship, and as your church. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask that you would open up your word to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, that's a lovely passage from Jeremiah, and of course, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. He didn't have an easy time. Um, God told him very directly that he had been called to be a prophet before he was formed in the womb. And, and that just maybe gets you to think about your own life, that what you and I are experiencing today, and what we experienced yesterday, and what we'll experience tomorrow, God knew about before he formed you in the womb, before the universe ever started and there's a lot of debate about when that was, but um, God knew you and me, and God loved us. And he tells the children of Israel here that, that he loves them with an everlasting love. And that's something that Jeremiah had to know because if you look at the first chapters of Jeremiah, you'll see that God says to, to Jeremiah, I want you to go out and I want you to tell people my word, but don't be worried if they oppose you. In other words, there was an inkling there that they weren't going to respond in the positive way that a preacher would like somebody to respond to, to say, yeah, that's interesting and I'll think about that and I'll maybe change that aspect of my life. Jeremiah needed to know that God loved him. Why? Because the challenge that he faced was so great. It was such a great challenge that he was, he was uh, being sent out um, to, to be involved in. And in verse three here, um, God says very powerfully, um, yes, it's like an, he's affirming it. He says, yes, there's no doubt about this. He says to the children of Israel, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. And it wasn't just that God loved the children of Israel in his heart. And I think sometimes as Christian, we can think of God as being a bit far away. But if you think about God, God's a living being. You know, sometimes in church, we get a bit tied up with rules and regulations, don't we? We do this and we don't do that. But God's a living being. And if you look at the history of the church, sometimes people who did great things for God in the history of the church, what they did was they actually stepped outside the normal rules, didn't they? And they kind of went for it and great things happened. Like, for example, William Booth or, um, you know, John Wesley. People like that, they, they sort of stepped outside what was being done normally. They didn't go with the rules and regulations of the church. Another person was somebody like, say, Mary Slessor, who worked in a jute factory in Dundee. Now, I was at a conference about probably 10 years ago now, and there was a, a pastor there from Nigeria, right, whose 
ancestors, if you chased it back to his mum and dad and grandparents, right all the way back to Mary Slessor, had been converted through what she had done as part of the mission to Calabar in Nigeria. Now, had she just thought, well, you know, I work in a jute factory, so I'm just staying here. But she had a call in her heart and she followed it. And all through the generations, there's been a big impact in that area from Christianity. And, and don't doubt the, the, the impact that Christianity has in some parts of the world. I know in many parts of the world, as, as um, one of my fellow elders was praying this morning, there's a lot of persecution. But I, I remember at, at university, there was a, um, a, a girl in, in my university class, her parents helped a mission um, in Africa, and, and in Southern Africa. And she, uh, it was, um, and she said she'd gone out to visit uh, to see what the work was. I think it was called African Evangelical Fellowship. I don't know if it exists anymore. But she said the difference between the villages that had been Christianized and those who weren't was stark. It was really stark. Because in, in the villages that were Christianized, um, the, the, the family operated the way it should. There was mom and dad and there was the youngsters and there was a kind of a, a different structure in the other villages that were the tribal villages that had rejected Christianity or, or hadn't been evangelized or didn't want to know, it was completely different. There was a big pot of um, like a brew. The men sat and drank it all day. The women worked in the fields. And as soon as a girl reached puberty, the men just passed her around for their own amusement. And they, 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 they just, for their own sexual pleasure. And of course, the number of, of diseases and stuff was just dreadful. And she said the difference between the non-Christian village and the Christian village was immense. And in places like Calabar, that was taken out by people, uh, the Christian faith was taken out by people from Scotland. And they made a big impact in those areas and still do to this day. So don't ever, end up, uh, ever underestimate the power that you and I can have in someone's life. Because the person that we're speaking to, it may be the person who goes and does something amazing like finds the cure for cancer or goes to a part of the world that's never heard the gospel or whatever. We just don't know. And, and wh why, why, why is it like that? It's like that because God puts his love into people's hearts. God's a living being. And, and God wants us to feel his love and compassion for other people. And if you look at the ministry of Jesus, Jesus was quite hard-headed in what he said to the, to the Pharisees and those who rejected him, but he had a lot of time for the ordinary people who didn't know they were like sheep without a shepherd. He had a lot of love and compassion. And that feeling of love and compassion for them, he went and loved them and helped them and got alongside them. And that's something that you and I can do. I think in these days in which we live, sometimes a listening ear to someone or, or a, a, a just being with somebody can actually do so much good. And, Jesus, and when, when Jesus was on the earth, he, he showed this love in a deep way that's being talked about here in Jeremiah. And if you look at verse nine, the second part of it, it says a very tender thing. Um, God says, I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. And Ephraim in this context is the, the tribes in the south, the southern area of, of Israel. I am a father to Israel. Now there's no other religion or philosophy in the world where the God, the God of the Jews, who is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, says that he's a parent figure. He's a father to us. None. None at all. Christianity, as revealed in the scripture, is the only belief system where God is your father. And what that means is that God wants to have a relationship with you and with me, right? And God wants what's best for us. And God wants to communicate that love to us. And God wants us to know about that love, but he also wants us to feel it within our hearts. That he, that he loves us. We can experience God, particularly when we come to the scripture, when we're together as a fellowship, but God wants us to experience that love. So it's not just an idea in our head, it's something that we actually experience in our hearts. We can, we can well up with that love and, and we can share that love with other people. We, we, we do go the extra mile for other people. Why? Be, well, because God went the extra mile for us, didn't he? God sent us Jesus to die for us as we thought about in the table. So God expects us to care for other people in the same way he cared for us. And you and I don't know what, what um, impact that might have on, on someone's, someone's life. And then in verse uh, 14, it's interesting that this kind of life where we live by the love of God, um, 
uh, God's, God says, I will satiate or I will fill up, satisfy the souls of the priests with abundance and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. Because God loves us, God wants us to be satisfied in this life and for our hearts to be filled with that which is good. And it uses the word priests there. And of course, in Old Testament times, there, there were priests who prayed for the people and made sacrifices and then the, they brought the word of God to the people so it was a two-way process through the priest. But we've got a great high priest and we're all priests. Every person who believes in Jesus Christ has direct access to God. We don't need a pastor or an elder or a Willem or a, or a deacon or a bishop. We're all priests. So when you pray to God, you have direct access to God. And isn't it wonderful that we can read our Bibles and know that? You know, in medieval times, people were controlled by the priest. The priest gave out the forgiveness of sins. We don't need that now. Why? Because we're all priests. If someone truly repents of, your, of, of their sin and someone asks sorry for their, says sorry for their sins, you can say to them, your sins are forgiven. Right? We're all priests. We all have direct access to God. And God forgives sins, but we can declare if you believe in Jesus Christ, your sins can be forgiven. And that's a tremendous thing to know. And I think for lots of people today, they don't see Christianity as the, the, the religion of love. I think sometimes it's quite formal and structured and it's a bit odd to them. So I think we, by loving people and by caring for them in our communities, the way that we can convey the love of Christ. Because it is a big barrier sometimes, I think, for people who've never been in church or not been to church for a long time to come into a church building, no matter what the denomination is. Although every church I've ever come to, um, I've always been very gratefully received. Um, and, and God's great act of love, as I, as I mentioned earlier at the table, um, can be seen and, and, uh, in, in the, the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And then from that, he poured out his Holy Spirit. And we see that in John 6, 3.16, where it says, and we all know this verse, but when I was reading it the other day, I thought, I skirt over this too quickly. It says, for God so loved the world. And I think that's God so loved the world. It isn't just that God loved the world back 2,000 years ago when Jesus was on the earth. Because Jesus' sacrifice is as powerful today as it was then. Because Jesus was sacrificed, we're told by Paul, before the world ever began, Jesus was sacrificed. That was in the mind of God to do that. So the love of God for the world is not just 2,000 years ago, it's actually today. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, should not live a life where they don't have this satisfaction that he wants to give to his people and they don't have that sense of goodness in their hearts that, that God wants to give to his people, um, but have eternal life. And we know that eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. So God's love for the world, and just think about how do you perceive the world just now? Just think about what you're experiencing of the world, of, 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 of life in Bucky and Murray and Scotland and what we see in the news. What's your, what, what's your perception of the world? Is it a happy place? Is it a broken place? Is it a sad place? There's a lot of good in the world, isn't there? There is a lot of good. There are a lot of people doing good things in the world and helping out and, and what have you, even in the midst of some of the dreadful stuff that's going on in places like Ukraine. Um, one of our uh, elders, he helps run a mission out in Romania and he's got contact with a Baptist church in Ukraine. And bear in mind that, uh, you probably know this anyway, Ukraine has the highest number of Baptist churches anywhere in the world apart from uh, the USA. So lots of our Baptist Christian brothers and sisters are in the Ukraine. And God's doing good things through them. So even in the horror of that war, God's actually showing his love. And that shows something very powerful, doesn't it? Because if you look at human history, some of the love of God has been shown in some of the toughest times. Some of the most dreadful things that have happened, the Christian church, Christian people have been able to show their love. And not necessarily in, in great big, you know, outlandish ways about somebody, somebody standing up on a podium or doing something in a government parliament. Just somebody who has experienced something pretty dreadful, having a Christian friend sitting beside them just listening to them or helping them out with funeral arrangements or whatever it is. Those are the things that, that matter. Why? Because people matter to God. 
We all matter to God. Everybody in Bucky, in Murray, in Scotland, in the world matters to God. And we've just read there, for God so loved the world. But God didn't love the world and then kind of leave it. God loved the world and then sent his spirit into our hearts to carry that love on. And that's an amazing thing to know, that God loves this world and all of the people in it. Even the people that we would find objectionable, we wouldn't maybe sit with them. You know, maybe some world leaders, you think, oh my goodness, does God love him? Does God love her? You know, you think about President Putin. It's quite a big question, isn't it? Does God love go as far as him? Think of what he's unleashed. Think of the suffering that he has unleashed. But then, maybe in the past, when Russia asked to join the EU, and the EU said no, and they asked to join NATO, and NATO said no, you know? You know, Putin's done dreadful things. His army have done dreadful things. But the thing about it is, God loves him so much that he sent Jesus to die for him. But then again, Putin's no worse than me, or no better than me. Because Psalm 51 says that I was born in sin and shaken and in iniquity. Okay? I don't think they thought that when I was born in the, the Moyle Hospital in Larne. <laughs> you know, they didn't really think that in County Antrim um, at that time, probably. But that's the reality. I'm no worse or better than him. And I think that we sometimes are very harsh on people when maybe if we were in the situation that some people are, find themselves in, we would probably do the same. I often think about that when um, I hear about folks who end up in prison. Quite often, if you think about the family situation they're been brought up in, and I'm not judging anyone, um, one of the lads I went to primary school with went, ended up in prison for murder. But he had a pretty grim family upbringing. And he just fell in with a crowd of lads, and he was accepted, and they started doing bad things, and the next thing is, he's the one with another lad who do the murders. But the people who kind of set them all up, they don't go to prison, do they? It's these two lads who were manipulated, you know? And, you know, sometimes I, I have to, I can be quite judgmental, or oh, it serves them right, but then again, if, if that had been me, I would expect people to be compassionate. Um, and, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis said this, he said, the Christian does not think God will love us because we are good. You know, we're, we're made in the image of God, so we have a goodness, we can think and creative and be kind. We, the Christian does not think God will love us because we are good, but then C.S. Lewis writes, but that God will make us good because he loves us. God wants his love to have a positive impact upon our hearts and not make us self-centered I think the biggest regret in my life, as I look back over it, um, is, is I've probably been very self-centered. Christianity's been all about me, to be honest, a lot of the time. And um, it's taken a lot of experiences for God to, to get me to see um, that actually Christianity is not about me. It's Martin Luther wrote that because he knew God loved him, it freed him up to love other people. He didn't have to worry about himself. He was then free to love other people. And sometimes when you go out of your way to help people, people can be suspicious and think you've got a hidden agenda or whatever. But I think as Christians, we should just naturally love people and be kind and generous to them. And if people are suspicious of that, you know, you're loving somebody to get them along to church or whatever, you see them as kind of soul fodder, you know, that kind of idea. But we love human beings because God loves them in a real and deep way. Why? Because Jesus gave his life for them. And of course, God desires that everyone comes to faith. And that's a tall order. But that's, that's, God, that, that's, that's God's desire. And if you look at the likes of Paul, Paul, for example, found out this when he um, um, uh, was, was working with the likes of Barnabas. And um, if, if you... Paul, had, Paul was quite... Uh, uh, he got quite fixed ideas about people. And what it meant was that sometimes he fell out with his compatriots, as we all do. But yet, the love of God was able to still work in, in Paul's life. And, and Paul knew about the love of God. And if you, re you read 1 Corinthians 13, Paul 
writes some beautiful words, and we often have them at weddings and, and different times in, in the life of the church. But what, what I, I think is that if you think that God is love, then you can actually substitute the word God for love in 1 Corinthians 13. And I'll just read it out, because this will help you to see what softened Paul's harsh Pharisee heart, and which, what can soften our hearts, and, and my heart particularly. Listen to this when you put this in. It, it just sound, it, it sounds lovely. God suffers long, or God is patient. Have you ever thought about how, God patient, how patient God is with us? So God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy. God does not parade himself. God is not puffed up with pride. God does not behave rudely. God does not, does not seek his own. God is not provoked. God thinks no evil. God does not rejoice in wrongdoing. God rejoices in the truth. God bears all things. God believes all things. That means positively about his people. He always believes in us and our ability to be better people. He never gives up on us. God hopes all things. God endures all things. God never fails. So Paul wrote that. And think of what, what, what Paul was. Whenever you and I feel like somebody's a lost cause or we feel we're a lost cause, remember what Paul was doing before his Damascus Road experience. And then he writes this. And he knew that God never failed him. God never failed him. And he was able to write these things. And if you look at Paul and his engagement, for example, with um, uh, the believers in Acts. So maybe just if we look at um, Acts 4, we'll see... Um, somebody called Barnabas. Now, you probably know about Barnabas and you've had, probably had a sermon on Barnabas. He was called um, uh, the, uh, Joseph, but he was named Barnabas, which is the son of encouragement. And if you look at um, Acts chapter four, the, the believers were having a hard time. John and Peter were being arrested. They were being hassled. Um, and if you look at um, verse 17 and 18 of, of that um, chapter, um, the, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, um, they called them together. And in verse 18, they said to John and Peter, um, don't speak or teach in the name of Jesus. We're shutting this down, right? We're shutting this down. And, they, and the, potentially, if they continued, they could be executed. They, they understood that because obviously Jesus had been executed by these folks. So this was a serious situation to be in. And then in verse 21, they further threatened them. So they didn't just threaten them once. They further threatened them and they let them go because the people had, were glorifying um, God for what had been done to the lame man who'd been healed, right? And the response of the church at this time was a response of love. And what could they do? They couldn't take on the Sanhedrin because they were so well armed, etc. So the response of love to support their brothers, Peter and John, and to support everyone else was to pray and you can see that in verse 23 onwards. And actually the place was sh shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So maybe that's our first response in love to people when they're struggling or when something's going on that's not right is to pray. Although we, we quite often try and take things into our own hands and sort it ourselves. Maybe we should take it to God first, right? So that was prayer. But then if you look at verse 32 through, it talks then through to the end. It says, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, that they had all things in common. That's love. Communal love, isn't it? They were looking out for each other. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of Jesus, and great, great grace was upon them all. And nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of things that they sold. And they laid them at the apostles' feast, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. So, they prayed as an act of love, but they also gave as an act of love, right? And then here it says, and, and Joseph, or Joseph, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, that is translated son of encouragement, um, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So Barnabas is mentioned here, and what he's doing is he's actually, in an act of love, sells some land 
and gives it to the church to look after people who are in need. And that's a pretty big thing to do because that was maybe his inheritance land. We don't know. I'm assuming so. So he does that as an act of love, right? Now, if you then go to um, Acts chapter 11, and I'm going to make a point out of this, so hopefully you'll bear with me. You go to verse 25, right? It talks about Barnabas departs for Tarsus to seek Saul, right? So, um, to, and, and that actually, and when he gets a hold of Paul, he brings him to Antioch, right? So that it was for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Now, you can understand how Barnabas may not have been very keen because although Saul had been converted, etc., and the story had gone about. Um, I'm sure people may be quite wary of him at times, but what he does is he goes and gives Paul a boost and he brings him to Antioch to help out because he knows he's such a good teacher and the people need a teaching there, right? And Because a great number of people had believed and had turned to the Lord, right? And when the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch, Right? And he saw the issue. And he didn't just think, right, there's an issue here. I'm going to sort this because I know what I'm doing. He said, no, no, there's an issue. These people need teaching. Who's the best teacher? It's Paul. So he went all the way to Tarsus, which is quite a distance, an act of love, and brought Paul back to the people because he knew the people needed teaching. Right? So he's actually investing in Paul's ministry. And he's, he gives, I'm sure Paul felt pretty boosted oh, they want me to come. Because remember, in the back of Saul's mind, although he had been forgiven, you know, not too long before, what was he doing? He was there condoning the execution of Christians. And yet Barnabas overcomes that prejudice with love, the love of God that's in his heart, right? And the thing about it is, if you then go on a wee bit more and you look at Acts 12 and 25, right, it says there, Acts 12, 25, Barnabas and Saul returned home for Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and they also took with them John, whose name was Mark. Right? John, whose name was Mark. So it's actually Barnabas and Saul. But then if you go to Acts 13, 43, and nothing in the scripture is written by accident. If you go to Acts 13, 43, it says, now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. So Paul's name's obviously changed. Saul's name's changed to, to Paul. And he then takes the preeminence. Barnabas has enough love in his heart to recognize Paul's ability to teach in his ministry and he takes the back seat. Who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So Barnabas then steps back and lets Paul take the preeminence because he realized he could have been jealous. He could have said, well, I was, I was here first and I've not done all the terrible things that you've done, but he doesn't. In love, he encourages Paul and he takes, um, he takes him, um, you know, he takes him these places and he gives him the opportunity and he encourages him and I'm sure he, he boosts Paul's confidence in the Lord. Barnabas was willing to humble himself and take second place to Paul. This, love was this was love expressed through the encouragement of fellowship and also followership. Someone once wrote, if you want to be a great leader, you have to be a great follower. And that's particularly true in Christianity. If you want to lead anything or be in charge of anything, you've got to be a great follower. And that's to be a follower of the example that was set by, by Jesus. And if we go to Acts chapter 15, we see that um, Barnabas is encouraging again. Um, now, let me see where this, yeah. If we go to Acts chapter 15 and verse um, 36, we see, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, now let us go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing it. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, John Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp 
that they part, parted from one another, so, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So Paul had this prejudice against John Mark because he had deserted him before. Now, you can understand that because the relationship was broken at a previous time. But you know, Barnabas was this guy who actually said, well, Paul, fine, that's fine. You go on, but I'm, I'm going to try and encourage and restore John Mark here. This is love and action, you see. And it's hard, isn't it? It's not easy because he's restoring relationships and he's working in a context where relationships have been broken and where people are, are being contentious. And it's a sharp contention. It must have been a right row. Or as they say where I'm from, it was a row as big as a fight. It was a big row. But yet they went their own separate ways. Right? And you can see that the love was ex expressed in encouragement um, to John Mark in spite of his failure. But that's the love of God, isn't it? Because what does 1 Corinthians say? God, love never fails. Love never fails. Love never gives up on people. And that's a real challenge to, to all of us in, in the Christian church. So this love was expressed in encouragement in spite of failure. And Barnabas stood his ground with Paul, which must have been quite a thing to do because Paul was a very, very clever man and probably could have had a lot of different arguments about John Mark just going away a different way and, and that wasn't fair, etc., etc. But he stands his ground. And if you think about the history of the Christian church and the history of the scripture, think about all those people who failed. Just think about it, right? And lift the focus off ourselves just now because we've all failed so we don't want to get too depressed about this. But think about the people in the scripture I, I just was looking at a wee list. Lot failed, didn't he? Lot failed. Samson. Jonah. David. John Mark. Peter. Paul had failed before he came to know the Lord. And you and me. And throughout Christian history, if you look at it, lots of people have failed along the way and got it wrong. But yet, here, Barnabas, is, he is keen to, um, to encourage in spite of the failure, right? And it paid off. It paid off. And the reason we know it paid off is because when Paul was writing his second letter to Timothy, if you look at 2 Timothy 4.1, right? Um, Paul's been abandoned again. It seems to happen quite a lot. Um, but then Paul was the one who was targeted by, by the authorities because he was the one who was, who was leading the mission, so to speak, the mission, so to speak. Paul writes this in 2 Timothy 4 and 11. Only Luke is with me. So Luke, the beloved physician, had stuck with him. Only Luke is with me. Get Who? get Mark. Did you see what happened? He didn't want Mark previously because Mark had failed him. And he says, get Mark. Right? And bring him, to, bring him with you. Get Mark, bring him with you. Why? For he is useful to me for ministry. Isn't that an amazing restoration, isn't it? Because I think that the human thing is be, right, would be he's failed, he's failed once. John Mark's failed. He went, he went away the other way. He, he, he failed. We're not going to take him, and that's it. We shut the door on him. We shut the door on him, and that's him finished. But you see, Paul probably had a very deep sense of the love of God for him. Why? Because of how he treated Christians before he was converted. And that's why he writes, get Mark. In other words, go and get him. Make sure you get Mark. And bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And that love that Barnabas showed for John Mark paid off in the long term. And Paul writes, quite simply, get Mark and bring him with you. So, I sort of sauntered through that, but you can see the impact of love in the life of Paul. 
where he actually does not give up. Why? Probably because God hadn't given up on him despite all the mistakes he made. And there's probably more uh, than I ever record in scripture. So maybe we need to think about that in terms of, um, you know, is there anybody that we've given up on? Well, just remember, you and I may give up on people, but God never does. God never gives up on people, despite what we might think. And just think about that for a few seconds. Let's be honest with ourselves. I find this very challenging reading this because I am quite sort of, oh, that's it. And maybe our relationships as humans are not black and white. Maybe they're more gray. So who have you and I given up on? I can think of someone straight away that I've given up on and I've had to repent or change my mind about that and change my heart and ask God for help. And then, what do we need to ask God to forgive us for in relation to some of the people we've given up on and people who've wronged us and we've had a bad attitude towards them? So, are there some things that we have to forgive, ask God to forgive us for? And I can think straight away, when I did this during, I was writing this out yesterday afternoon, I found it very challenging because, (laughs) you know, I needed to ask for God's forgiveness. And once we thought about that, maybe, is who can we encourage this week? Barnabas had a ministry of encouragement. He didn't want to be the guy up front. He was quite happy to take second place to Paul. He was quite happy to work with Paul and get John Mark restored. And he probably chatted to Paul over a meal many a time, saying, oh, John Mark's doing this over there, and John Mark's gone to that synagogue, and these people have done this, and he's helped these folk out, just dropping in those little little hints that John Mark's getting on okay, you know, Paul. He put a good word in for him. And maybe there's somebody that we need to put a good word in for. And maybe there's somebody that we need to encourage. And as we come out of lockdown, as we move forward to the the future, you know, you know folks in your community and your families, and as do I. There are folk who are hurting. There are folk who are despondent. There's very high levels of anxiety in the community. And I think it's quite surprised a lot in the medical profession because there's no real reason for the anxiety, really. People should be feeling happier going forward, but there's a lot of anxiety in people's hearts. People who feel down. Maybe there's folks who feel left out, marginalized. Maybe there's just somebody who needs a listening ear. They just need somebody to sit down with them and listen to them. And they'll feel, they'll feel a bit better. I remember I was speaking to um, a, a man once on the phone who was complaining about something. And I didn't say anything. And at the end of it, he said, thank you for listening to me. I didn't say anything. I just listened. (laughs) Thank you for listening to me. He felt unburdened. So just think about that in terms of our relationships and who can we encourage? Because God loves everyone and God never gives up on anyone.
Santa 